Okay, good afternoon. Uh, let's get started with our lecture for today. Um, the last thing we did on Monday was our, our uh, first exam. So I have not finished creating those yet. Uh, so I'll be working on that this week and hopefully by Monday you will have your your grades and, and your feedback on the on the papers. So I'll keep you posted uh, on that progress. Uh, most likely you will see the, the scores so on, on Canvas and I will send an email just to let you know the, the scores are available and you can reach out to me if you have questions. We can meet over office hours or we can meet after class. So you will have an opportunity to to discuss your, your exam with me, okay? So I'll let you know when those scores are available, uh, but those are not ready yet. Um, I'm also waiting, there's a couple of students taking the exam today, so I'm waiting for them to, to get through uh, the process and then I'll be providing feedback to everybody. Uh, any questions? So, so now we're transitioning to a, a new lecture. Um, Lecture four is on manufacturing systems. So the idea is to learn about the different type of manufacturing systems that could be inside a facility and then apply those concepts to the design and the location of departments and the design of the layout of a, of a facility. So today we're gonna to spend some time discussing the different type of manufacturing systems and that material is part of chapter eight of your textbook, Manufacturing Systems. So as always, I start the discussion with the objective for this class, uh, develop an understanding of the principles of facility location, layout and material handling systems, and to practice design facilities. So that will be the objective that is connected to this lecture. We will talk about the different type of manufacturing systems from the context of, of how material handling systems are connected, how material handling is important for those type of different manufacturing systems, um, and so on. Um, so the rest of the objectives are, are listed, listed here. If you don't know, we will have our AVET uh, process, evaluation process starting next week. So maybe some of you are gonna be involved in that process. Uh, I, I think there's some students that, I will, be, that will be meeting with the, with the evaluators. Uh, so that's why it's important for us to keep you connected with, with the objectives and how that relates to, to your education then inside the, the School of Engineering. So next week we'll have the evaluators looking at our program and um, hopefully we will continue having our accreditation as an AVID. Um, program, even school, all our programs are accredited right now. So we, we are going through that process and we have to go through that process every six years. So we are, we are starting the six years count this year. Um, so the agenda for today, uh, the introduction, manufacturing systems, and then we will talk about these different types, fixed automation systems, flexible manufacturing systems, single stage multi-machine systems, and then finally, just-in-time manufacturing. So I know some of you are from manufacturing, so have you, are you familiar with these different type of, of manufacturing systems? Good. Um, even the industrial engineer students should be at least have heard about these different uh, types, uh, even though we are not in, in, in the manufacturing um, program per se. But we, we discussed those in, in different courses. So 
we will go in deep. We will talk about each one of them. And after that, we will stop our lecture. So the learning objectives is to understand this, that several types of manufacturing systems. Again, fixed automation systems, flexible manufacturing systems, single stage multi-machine systems, and just in time. Manufacturing as they relate to facilities planning, which is our goal. So efficiency of the manufacturing activities will make a, a, a major contribution to the firm's short and long economic uh, profitability. So we want to have a efficient designs uh, within our manufacturing process. We know that if we are looking at uh, the output, and we are looking at quality of our product, we want those processes or those systems to be efficient, to be reliable, um, because that's at the end is going to affect your profit. So it's very important for us to understand this different type of uh, activities that are happening within the manufacturing process. Uh, the effectiveness of the facility layout and material handling in these facilities will be influenced by a number of factors. Okay, so again, material handling is very important. You, you are gonna take your product from one station to the other and the type of, mat of uh, material handling process that you use Will, will, will be based on obviously your capacity limitations in terms of, of money, but also on the efficiency that is required for your process. So, so this will be influenced by a number of factors, including changes in product mix and design. So if you are dealing with different type of products, if you're dealing with different design within your product, uh, the materials and processing technology, so what type of materials are you using? Can you handle those with any equipment or do you need any specific specialized type of equipment to handle that type of material? Um, handling storage and control technology, production volumes, schedules and routings, and finally the management philosophies. So the philosophy of the people making the decisions. So again, the effectiveness of the facility layout and material handling will be influenced by these factors. Um, other external factors that affect the facility planning uh, process, those include the, uh, the vol volume of production, the variety of production, and the value of each product. So uh, uh, we, we, we already mentioned the, the relationship between um, the volume and the mix of product and how that relates to our facilities planning. Now we are trying to connect that with the manufacturing system. So again, volume of production, the variety, the mix of production and the, the value in terms of the, the cost uh, of each product will have also a significant impact. Each of these factors may lead to different type of manufacturing facilities. So we talk about uh, fix, right? So job, job shop will be a more centralized manufacturing system, or we can have a production line in which you have a high volume of product uh, being manufactured, and you're taking those through that line uh, faster. Or cellular manufacturing, which we already mentioned how to, um, to design those uh, depending on the number of products that you have and the number of machines. And, and so cellular manufacturers will be more flexible so you can manage different types of, of mix of products. So each of these factors may lead to a different type of manufacturing facilities. So let's talk about uh, fixed automation systems. So, in here, I'm showing uh, this fixed automation system that uses a continuous linear well up to 30 feet long, which uses a track system along which the power source, welding wire, and an automated arm travel. So basically what we have here is a, a very long um, bar that we are trying to weld and uh, the process is fixed. You have this arm moving uh, 
The part is not moving. What is moving is the arm doing the, the welding. And that's what we call a fixed automation system. We have the product fixed. What is moving is the, the equipment around that product. Um, another example of fixed automation systems is what we call the transfer line. So materials, in this one, the material flow from one workstation to the next in a sequential manner. So you start, you still have this conveyor in the middle and you're moving that product inside in, in that conveyor. And every time it moves forward, something is uh, processed or something is added to the, to the product. The production rate for this line is governed by the slow operation. Typically we call this the bottleneck. So that station is the one that is keeping the pace of production, the slowest station or the slowest operation. Transfer lines are often used for high volume production and are highly automated. So this type of uh, transfer line is used for those specific uh, scenarios in which you have a very high volume of production. Uh, so everything is highly automated. What are the disadvantages? Is everything is highly automated, it's gonna be expensive because you're gonna have to spend money putting those robots, programming those robots, uh, and also providing maintenance. So there's a high equipment associated with transfer line. Uh, inflexibility in the number of products manufactured. So setup is fixed. So if you want to produce something else, it will be very difficult. It doesn't give you a lot of flexibility unless it's very similar. If you have a product that is not within the same dimensions or requires the same number of operations, then it will not be possible for you to use that for other products. Inflexibility in the layout, again, since you have all this equipment, sometimes very heavy, you have to fix that into space. So you might not be able to change that layout later on. Large deviation in production rates in case of equipment failure, that's very important. If you have a conveyor that is basically fixed and you have to process this through that line, if one of the machines goes down, then you will have a, you will have to stop the process until that machine or equipment is fixed. So there, there will be a deviation. It's not like you can take that through another route. You will have to fix that machine or that equipment in order to continue your production. So the design of transfer lines include both the specification of the individual processing stages and the linkage of the stages, I mean that conveyor or any type of material handling that you're gonna use to connect these stations to complete the processes. So fixed automation systems, uh, transfer line is one of them. Uh, so facility planning for the transfer line is relatively straightforward. The processing equipment is arranged according to the processing sequence. So again, very it's fixed. It's a process that is fixed. Um, so you're going to arrange the equipment according to to that sequence. And as a result of the predictable flow sequences, a straight line flow and its derivative are frequently used. So typically, you will have a set of lines or manufacturing lines in parallel. Uh, arranged inside the facility, but there are other variations that are used according to the space that you have available. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show you some of those. So you will expect to see uh, a U-shape, circle shape, or the straight line, which is what we, we have here. So we have the straight line flow. So you have the sequence of stations arranged in this horizontal line, or you have the U-flow, Again, you need, uh, if you don't have the space to accommodate a straight line, you can use that different shape. The only difference now is how you're gonna accommodate your material handling. So you see the stations 
the, they're represented by the same shape. The only thing that is different is the material handling. So that line is representing the, the lines are representing the material handling. So it could be a conveyor, it could be a transfer car um, and so on. And then the circular flow, again, um, it all depends on the type of material handling that you're using. So if you, if you're using a conveyor, most likely you're gonna have the straight line. If you're using a, a robot arm, then the circular flow would be easier for the for the arm to travel. You, if not, you would have to have a conveyor just to move the, the arm. So if it's if it's a material handling that you can just put in the middle of the of the process, then the circular flow will be more efficient and so on. So these are variations of the straight line flow structure. And this is what I was referring to, uh, going back to the circular flow, uh, dial indexing machine. It's a one particular implementation of the circular flow is the dial indexing machine. And I have a picture of it right there. Um, so parts go from one machine to another without manual intervention. So essentially what you have is this uh, plate taking care of the material handling and circulating the, the product. And then the process is happening as, as the, the parts move. Uh, materials are transferred from one machine to the next in a sequence by a automated material handling system. So that's what we are showing up in here. Um, a few examples include Um, automated assembly system for car parts, chemical process production systems, beverage bottling and canning processes, heat treatment and surface treatment processes, and steel fabrication pro uh, processes. So in those type of production systems, you will see this type of dial index uh, machine. with the circular flow pattern. Okay, so that's little, um, some information about fixed automation systems. We talk about the transfer line and the dial indexing uh, machine. Now let's transition to what are flexible manufacturing systems. So flexible manufacturing systems or FMS are able to manufacture a large number of different part types. So again, in the previous example, fixed manufacturing system, you will not be able to manufacture different types. The fixed process, same type of production process. Now we are transitioning to something more uh, flexible and that's why we have the name. Uh, so able to manufacture a large number of different parts. The components of a flexible manufacturing system are the processing equipment, material handling equipment, and a computer control equipment. This computer control equipment is used to track parts and manage the overall flexible manufacturing system. Uh, so scanners, um, just to make sure that you are following the right sequence. So you identify the part, um, RFID technology type of, of thing that we can use. So the, the part is scanned, the information is captured by the computer. And then the next step in the process is assigned to that particular part. So if it needs to be moved to machine X, then the machine will make that decision. So the computer control equipment is very important uh, to track the parts and to manage the overall flexible manufacturing system. Situations for which a flexible manufacturing system might be appropriate, production of families of work parts. So again, a large number of different parts, random launching of work parts onto the system. So if you don't have like a fixed production schedule in which you know what's gonna happen at 
each particular time. You're just randomly launching things into your production facility. That flexible manufacturing system is more appropriate for those type of situations. Uh, reduce manufacturing lead time. You don't have a lot of time to do setups or you don't have a lot of time to move uh, machines around or to uh, replace um, if a machine. So you, you have a very short time to initiate your production or to deliver those products, then flexible manufacturing systems will be more appropriate. If you want to increase the machine utilization, that makes sense, right? So you, you, can, you can produce any more different type of parts with this system. So you can keep the, the system busy more time. So you will increase the utilization of your equipment. Um, reduce direct and indirect labor, and it provides better management control. Uh, the following that design requirements are recommended in designing material handling system for flexible manufacturing systems. Uh, random independent movement of palletized parts between workstations. Um, having some type of temporary storage or banking of parts in between. Having convenient access for loading and unloading. So again, you, you, you will have different type of process, well not processes, but different type of product families happening or being processed in this manufacturing system. So you have to provide for that flexibility in terms of changing parts. And also if you have to keep some of the, let's say you have a, a, a product in which you have more parts that are needed to complete the production. So you have some space for temporary storage and so on. Uh, compatibility with computer control. As I mentioned already, very important. We need to scan, we need to make sure to know where the next the next process for that part will be. Uh, provision for future expansion and adherence to all applicable industrial codes and access to machine tools. All those things will make um, this flexible manufacturing system or type of manufacturing system work and are part of the design requirements. So if you need to design for a facility that is going to use or if you know that your production will require uh, the production of different product families, flexible manufacturing system is going to be an option. You, be, you have to keep in mind that there are certain requirements for that type of flexible manufacturing system. Those are listed here. Um, so it's, it's not just designing for the process, it's also making sure that you are uh, keeping the space necessary, for example, for the um, access for loading and unloading, uh, access for uh, some type of storage and so on. Uh, flexible manufacturing systems are designed for small batch, meaning that low volume and high variety conditions. So again, multiple products that you're producing, Maybe small batch, meaning that you are producing certain amount, let's say 100 parts, and then you move to the next family, you do 100 more. So I, I think I mentioned that I was working for Johnson & Johnson. So you have, I don't know, you can go to the pharmacy and count how many different Tylenol products are. So every time that we move from one product to the other, we have to change one of the ingredients or maybe change the packages and so on, or the amount that is going to be put into the, the amount of product that is going to be put in, 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 into the uh, package and so on. So, so you have some flexibility. You need to have some flexibility for those purposes. So most of the time we have small batches, high variety, different type of products. Um, so because of the variety of alternatives for storing, handling, and controlling material, the specification of the material handling system and design of the layout can be, can be quite varied. So here's one um, 
diagram that illustrates the a flexible manufacturing system. So here we have different uh, machines, MC1, MC2, up to MC6. We have a centralized storage system. The arrows are representing the conveyors or the flow of the, of the parts, which are transported using an automatic guided vehicle transporter or AGV. So depending on if you have one product that requires to go to machine one, machine five, and machine six, when the, the part is picked up by the AGV, it's going to take that product to those stations and then it's going to take it back to the storage system. So that's the idea. You have this guided, you have a computer making those decisions saying, okay, your product or the next product will use these machines. You take them to those machines or you take a lot or a group of parts to those machines, you process them, and then you take them to the next part or to the next machine to complete the process. Uh, so that's an illustration of a centralized, a flexible machine system with centralized layout. Um, and this one is a um, little different. We have the storage now in the middle in this one. We have the storage to the, to the left. Here we have the uh, pallet storage in the middle. And you see that we have a shuttle for pallets to be moved from stations on this side. And we have another shuttle at the top for the, the other group of machines. Uh, we have an input output for each one. So at the top, we have an input output station. Again, you take the parts into the pilot shuttle, it's taken to one of these uh, machines, or it's taken to the pilot storage area in the middle and is removed when needed. And we have both processes uh, happening at the top and at the bottom. And this is called a flexible manufacturing system with internal centralized layout. So what this is showing is an internal centralized working process storage area. So if you move the parts, let's say you, you have a group of parts being processed in machine six. After they're done, you can put them in the working process area until let's say another machine is become available. So you can go back, pick up that pilot and bring it to machine five, complete the process, take them back to the inter to the middle, and you can even access the other side because once you put it in the centralized area for storage, you can pull them from both sides of the conveyors or both sides of the, of the process or the system. So put them in, uh, process them at the bottom, put it in the middle for storage, the convey, um, the uh, shuttle or the pallet shuttle can pick them up from the middle and also process those parts at the top. So flexibility again, um, different routes are allowed and so on. The working process or WIP is needed because a part has to go through several machines before it eventually leaves the system after the last machine in operation is performed. Okay, so again, based on your process or the different type or based on the product that you are going to manufacture, based on the space that you have available. It's not only identifying the type of process or the type of manufacturing system that you're gonna use, but also how you're gonna rearrange those in your facility. So these two are doing basically the same thing. The only difference is one is using one method for storage and transportation, and this one is using a different method for storage and transportation. So it will depend on the different products that you have available, the different routes, the space in your facility in order to make those decisions. Uh, this is another flexible manufacturing configuration. This is based on cellular manufacturing principles. So the idea here is you have uh, the machines and you have an arm or a robot handling system in the middle 
and it's going to be, you're gonna use that arm to move the parts between those stations uh, at the top, MC1, MC2, and MC3. Um, and you have this conveyor line. So after you're done processing, let's say you take this part through this route, So here you, you can take this part, let's say the arm will take it from here and we'll move it to here and maybe to here. And then the arm can put it here for the conveyor to move. Um, and then once you get to this point, maybe you just need to, the arm will pick that up. We'll move it to MC5. And then if nothing else is needed, it will return it. So again, same idea. Flexible manufacturing in the sense of being able to control the stations that your product is going to visit. So you have flexibility in terms of the products that you can process. Large variety of products, this will give you that flexibility. So the handling distances are reduced significantly as the machines are placed within the work envelope of the transfer line. Uh, so in this case, a robot handler in this illustration. So if you have not seen something like that, I have a video here. I think one of the uh, faculty members in, in the manufacturing department has one of these robots in his lab. Uh, so this is what I'm referring to. So you're picking up part from, from here. Let me make this faster. And then if, if it doesn't need to be manufactured on the first machine, you need it in the second one, then that robot will take care of that. We'll take it to the second machine, we'll put it there, it will process the part. And then when it's done, you take it back to the storage area. You process. But maybe for another different or, or other type of part, you would have to take it to both machines or to another machine in that same line. So what's going to happen now? This robot will take it back to, to the storage area. So it will put it there. It will slide, and it will be storage. Um, okay. Any questions so far, comments? Okay, so what makes flexible manufacturing system flexible? Must have the capability to do the following, process different part styles in a non-batch mode, accept changes in production schedule, responds gracefully to equipment, mold function, and breakdowns in the system. So remember the fixed manufacturing line, that was a big problem. That's not the case in flexible manufacturing and accommodate the introduction of new part designs. So again, since you have all these uh, machines that you can access with your uh, material handling equipment, you have you can develop different type of, or you can process different type of products using those machines. Okay. Uh, the next one is the single stage multi-machine system. We're getting halfway through. Um, so, this is a special case of flexible manufacturing systems. The machining centers in the uh, single stage machine systems are identical and versatile. So that all operations of any part can be performed on any one machine. Once a part is loaded on a machine, it does not leave the machine until all required operations are performed. Okay, so this is again a special case of a flexible manufacturing system. So in where all identical, all machine centers are identical and versatile. So all the operations on any part can be performed on any one machine. Under this type of manufacturing system, the tool delivery system becomes the critical resource.
So here we have a, an example of a um, single stage multi-machine system. And what you will see here that is different, uh, you have the guided vehicle here. You have the unloading, the unloading station, the RGV here. Um, and these are representing the parts, right? So the main difference is that you have all these stations at the top, MC1, MC2, MC3, and up to MC8. And you have a separate conveyor here. That in addition to have that conveyor that is delivering the parts to, to the machine centers, you also deliver in the different type of tools that you will need. So if you need a, let's say a, a drill from NC4, you have a separate conveyor at the top delivering those tools to that machine. So when you get the part there, you know that the tool will be there at the same time. Um, so, so that's essentially it. Uh, you, you have the flexibility, you have all these stations in which you can change the type of tool that you're going to be using according to your uh, product needs. So here we have a system with centralized tool storage. Um, you have the tool magazine and the machining center. Um, a different layout for the same type of, of system. Um, you have the part transported now in the middle. So we have the part transporter here. And we have the tool carrier going around the layout. So it'll be distributing those around the layout. Um, so again, if you need a, a, a different type of tool here, that will be delivered by this uh, conveyor that is running around the system. And then the parts are gonna be flowing inside the problem. So the parts will be flowing in this conveyor right here. Uh, so parts arrive according to the production requirement schedule. So you have to have a schedule for this to work. So you know when the part is needed and you also, you, need, you know where to send the part at what time and you know where to send the tool at the same time. So you can process that part. A part transporter system handles the delivery of parts from the input station to the machine and from the machine to the output station. And the part cannot be processed unless the required tool is available. So you have to have a good schedule system in place. So when you deliver the part to the station, you have the tool also there. Okay, the required tools are specified by the process plan. Some tools are resident to the machine while others are stored in a centralized tool uh, storage system. The part transporter, the part transportation activity is minimal since a part faces the machine only once. So that's why this is called single stage multi-machine system. Vehicles are dispatched based on part arrivals and job completions. When vehicles are idle or when vehicles become idle, one or more parts waiting to be transported. Tool carriers. The tool carrier handles the transport of tools to and from the centralized tool storage and the machines requiring the tool. We can also relocate the tools when opportunities arise. Okay, so this is basically summarizing what we just discussed. Um, and then when I mentioned the schedule, this is what I'm referring to. Okay, so we have a schedule for the machine and we have a schedule for the tool. So this is part of the process. And typically these are the things that we do as industrial engineers. So we have the system and we want to make sure that we optimize the way that things are gonna be processed. So we come up with this optimal schedules based on the capacity limitations for the system. So as you can see what this means is that 
sorry. So if you look at the schedule for machine one, what this is saying is that tool two will be in machine one for the first part. And then tool three will be delivered right after you're done with tool two. And then tool two will also go back there. You see the time is different now, depends on the, on the type of part that is being processed. And then you, you, you will have some idle time here. And then you have tool number three being delivered again to machine one. If you look at the tool schedule, it should match. Okay, so you see tool one is gonna go to machine two. So machine two will have tool one. Tool one will go to machine two at this point. So you have tool one here and tool one will be in machine one afterwards. So that's why you have this here. So those schedules are matching. There's one, uh, one thing that I found that is not correct. If you, if you look at the whole thing, everything will make sense until this one. So these two are not to be, should be um, drawn the same uh, time window. These two are not drawing the same time window. So I think that, and this is a picture from the textbook. So that's, that's an error, that's a, a typo of the book. Those two should be aligned. So it should be something like this. Okay, so that block should be here. Other than that, the rest of them are, are, um, are good. Those are, are well planned. Um, so those are the combined schedules of machines and tools. Okay, so the last one is the just-in-time manufacturing. And I think this is quite popular. If you haven't heard about just-in-time, this is a good time for you to learn about it. Uh, this type of system was made famous by Toyota. Um, I know you are very young. But in the in the 80s, late 70s, there was a revolution uh, in terms of how cars were manufactured, basically. Uh, so at that time, Chevrolet, Ford uh, were the highest selling companies for, for most type of cars. Um, but it got to the point that it became very expensive. Not only the car production, but also the type of cars that were manufactured were using a lot of gas. Um, so people started asking for other options, like cars that were smaller and also cheaper, and they, they were not they were not using a lot of uh, gas, basically. So for Toyota to be able to manufacture cars and sell them in the United States, they needed to find a different way other than the automatic line, processing line, that was typically used for car manufacturing and still used, but a different, one, a different way in terms of saving money. So cars could be less expensive and they can sell it, they will be able to sell it in the United States and in other countries. So they, they came up with this idea that they can save money by keeping the inventory uh, low, so they will save this warehouse cost. So if they keep their part inventory low, they didn't have to spend a lot of money uh, storing those parts. And the idea is that you are just gonna order more parts when you need them. Instead of keeping all these big warehouses uh, for storing purposes in your uh, facility and pull those from the storage, you will only ordered parts when you are receiving an order for your product. So if they were ordering 100 new cards, they would just pull or they will contact their um, suppliers and will say, okay, I need, I need parts for these many cars and I'm gonna produce those. Um, so that's what is called just in time. We are, we, are, we are using the system just in time to product, produce uh, the car. We are not, manufacturing a hundred pickup and let them wait until they are sold. We are manufacturing cars when they are needed to be sold. And that's, that's the idea. So 
The just-in-time production system was developed more than four decades ago by Oho Taichi at the Toyota Motor Company in Japan. And just-in-time applies to all forms of manufacturing. The idea is that they divide waste into the following seven categories. Uh, waste arising for overproduction, waste arising for time on hand or waiting, waste arising for transporting, waste arising from processing itself, waste arising from unnecessary stock on hand, waste arising from unnecessary motion, and waste arising for production or producing defective goods. And that's a very important part also. They put a lot of emphasis on the quality of the product. Uh, so they wanted to make cars that were reliable. That is, everybody wants to achieve that. I'm not saying that the other car companies didn't want it to achieve that. All of the car companies, their target is to put together a quality product. Uh, but under the just-in-time manufacturing system, it, will, it was easier to pick up parts that were defective early on in the process. Uh, because they were checking on the on the parts that were received, and if they find out something was what was bad, they will remove that quickly from the process. So that will not end up in the in the final product. So um, so waste arising for overproduction. This result on, of a production philosophy based on achieving economies of scale. That is, as the production lot increases, the unit production cost will decrease. So the idea here is that if you have a supplier, most of the time you will get a better price if you order a high, a, a, a lot of that product. So that's what we call economies of scale. So they will, um, they will, most of the companies at that time will buy all these parts, even though they will not need it in order to save money, because if they buy more, they will get a better price. The problem with that is, you will, you will be forced to overproduce because you need to use those parts and you need to store those parts. So you're producing without having a specified demand for your, uh, for your product. So they consider that a waste. They didn't want to go that direction. What they said it was production line must be reorganized, rules must be established to prevent overproduction, the restraint against overproduction must become a built-in feature on, of any equipment within the workplace. Waste from time on hand, these arise when a worker sends only one machine. Um, so they, they believe on, and, and that's this common practice now, you train your operator to be able to do multiple things. Uh, before that, you might have an operator being in charge of a single machine. And if that machine was not used, then that employee would not be doing something else in the facility. So they changed that. They wanted to have their workers being um, able to do multiple things within the facility so they avoid this idle time. Assigning more machines per worker, will reduce this weight. A better layout may also contribute to maximizing the number of machines that one worker can send. So that's that's why this cell manufacturing system became popular, because now you can have one person doing or taking care of multiple machines around them. This has resulted in workers uh, with multifunctional skills. Uh, well, waste for transporting comes from moving items over long distances from working process storage and from arranging and, or rearranging parts in containers and or pallets. Waste from transporting can be eliminated if the machines are placed close to each other. Again, by putting them close to each other, then you have to make sure that you don't have a lot of uh, inventory waiting between machines. Um, waste from processing operators unnecessarily tie up on a machine due to poor work case uh, design. For example, a pneumatic clamping device to hold work parts allows an operator to do more productive work. So you don't need the person tied to that machine. You can do that type of process using other, uh, maybe another tool or a different tool. So the ways the just-in-time philosophy is implemented uh, visibility can be obtained by the following technique. 
electronic boards for quick feedback. So you know how many parts are being produced per, per time period, you know how many parts are defective, and you have a goal being displayed. So you need to get to this goal today. Uh, feedback, full system with canvas. Um, so we're gonna show that in a minute. Problem boards, color standards, containers, uh, decentralized storage systems, mark dedicated area for inventory and tools. Um, simplicity can be achieved with a full system with Canvas, system setup changes, certified processes, small, small lot sizes, level production, simple machines, simple material handling, multifunctional workers, teamwork, etc. So what is a Canva? Canva is a card of, for a signal used to request or authorize production parts. It contains information on the part, the processes used, identification of storage area of the part, and the number of parts produced. So the idea here is that if you sold a, pro a product, right, you know there's a sequence of steps for you to get to that final product. So every time you pull a product out of your warehouse, a space is gonna be empty. So that empty space is gonna tell you, I need another part to cover this space. And then as you pull from the other side of the process, another space is gonna be available. And those are signals that will tell your process, okay, put another part here. As you move one part to one station, from, from one station to the other, another signal will be called until you get to the final or the first part of the process. So that's illustrated here. Very simple, nothing um, complex. Let me, after the announcement. So this is a Kanban full system, just in time. Uh, so you have a purchase order, one, two, three, four, five. Um, which is asking for one green base with a blue container. So one green base or a blue container, a box is used. You see space is generated, space generated, space generated here. So that's uh, created a signal. I need another container here, green container. So I go to that machine, that signal is passed, that's moved, another signal is made there. So the press will generate that new part. Um, same thing happening here. You have a blue container, so a check machine will that. And then you have a cardboard being also refilling that position. And you see there's a there's a canvas card signal in order for cardboard to be delivered. Uh, so when you get to a certain level, let's say of the number of boxes that you have available, a card will show up. And that will tell you you need to order more, more cardboard for your system. So in general, in a very simple way, that's how this works. Uh, you have this signals telling your process, I just pulled a product from my, from my system. I don't want to hold a large inventory of parts. I'm just gonna refill when a product is being taken out of my system. Um, so that simplicity, that process, since you are making sure that each area is refilled when needed, you're keeping an eye of all those parts. Okay, so a signal, a card is nothing fancy, it's just a car. A car is telling me I need another part. So let me put that signal, call the other process. And if a part is delivered, I can look at that part and say, okay, this part is in good shape. So I'm gonna keep it in my process. Uh, instead of just getting a pallet of 100 parts here that I cannot visually inspect, every time I get a part, I can inspect it. So that can keep the quality of your product very high. Uh, so that's the idea. And it worked, it worked. Uh, the, there's a lot of manufacturing processes that are following this uh, philosophy. Flexibility can be achieved with short setup times, short production times, small plus sizes, camera cars, flexible material handling equipment, multifunctional equipment, employees, I'm sorry, mixed model sequencing lines, etc. 
Standardization can be achieved with standard tools, equipment, pallets, methods, container boxes, materials, and processes. Organization is required for setup, for cleanliness, for work areas, for the camera system, for the storage areas, for tools, for teamwork activities. So organization is very key. Have to keep an organized system for this to work. Uh, just in time impact on facilities design, there are many concepts and techniques related to the just-in-time production system that impact building design, facility layout, and material handling systems, such as reduction of inventories, deliveries to point of view, quality at the source, better communication, line balancing, and multifunctional workers. Uh, in terms of reduction of inventories, Inventories can be reduced if products are produced, purchased, and delivered in small lots. Production schedule, schedule is leveled appropriately. Quality control procedures are improved if production material handling and transportation equipment are maintained adequately. Products are pulled when needed and in quantities that are needed. If the inventories are reduced, space requirements are also reduced. So you don't have to keep, you don't need a huge facility to complete the process or to manufacture your product. So a smaller facility means savings. Uh, smaller loads are moved and stored, justifying the use of material handling and storage equipment alternatives for smaller loads. Storage requirements are reduced, justifying the use of smaller or simpler storage system and the reduction of material handling. Consequently, the building could be smaller, a better plant layout can be used, and fewer handling and storage requirements might be needed. So you don't need a lot of material handling, less money that you put into this equipment. You don't need a lot of space, less money for renting a building or to build a facility, uh, and so on. Uh, deliveries to point of view, if products are purchased and produced in smaller lots, they should be delivered to the point of use to avoid stock out at the consuming processes. So quality of the source, this is what I just mentioned. Every supplying process will regard the next consuming process as the ultimate consumer. And each consumer process, consuming process must always be able to rely on receiving only good parts from its suppliers. To achieve the quality of source concept, following, the following could be required. Proper packaging, stacking, and wrapping procedures for parts and boxes on pallets and containers, efficient transportation, handling, and storage of parts, and production system that allows the worker to perform his or her operation without time pressure. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, this is the summary of topics that we covered this afternoon. Uh, any questions? Okay, so um, good. So hope you got something from, from our discussion today and we'll see you again on Monday uh, at the same time. Have a good weekend.